Okay, so, uh, so many new things, such as that new error screen that I just started with. So let's continue with our discussion of the great conversation. Now, as we head into Christmas time, uh, you might think Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. But you know what? I'm not going to talk about that one. Here's why. Because you've seen the movie. In fact, you've probably seen two or three or four or five or six different versions of A Christmas Carol. And so many of the versions are good. In fact, one of my favorites is The Muppet Christmas Carol. Um, and so many of the versions take the words straight from Charles Dickens's book. They don't really change the story much at all. And so you've read it. You know the story. I would still highly recommend that you read it. Uh, it is worth reading. It is a fun book to read, and it's a very quick book to read. It's almost as if Charles Dickens knew that we would have moving pictures eventually, and he wrote the story to be a two-hour movie. Uh, so anyway, you could read the book on your own, but you are familiar with that story. One story that you are probably not very familiar with, though, see, it's, I don't know what this means. That's weird. Where are my pictures? Huh, is that going to do it for all of them? Weird. Maybe if I do this. All right, we'll try it. What happens if I do this? Hey, look at that, it works. All right, so we'll go, we'll go with that. So you've all heard of Starbucks, Starbucks coffee, and you're probably wondering how in the world does Starbucks connect to Moby Dick, the great white whale? Well, uh, the story goes that the guy who cr first created Starbucks was a big nautical fan. He enjoyed the sea, he enjoyed the ocean, and he enjoyed the book Moby Dick. And he was thinking about naming his brand new coffee company mm, something like mm, Moby Dick. And his friends were like, mm, I don't think that's a good name for a coffee shop. But he kind of kept thinking at it, and he kept trying these different names, and he landed on the name Starbuck, who is one of the characters in Moby Dick. In fact, Starbuck is the second in command on the ship. And so Starbuck became Starbucks. Thus, every time you see this siren, and I don't know if you knew that, but that's a siren, and a siren comes from uh, Greek mythology. The siren was the beautiful woman. She, well, they were all beautiful women. They would sing, and the sailors would become so entranced by their voices that they would crash their ships on the rocky islands, and then they would drown. And that's what the sirens did. They would see a ship, and they would sing, and the ship would be pulled in. So anyway, the Starbucks symbol, it is a siren uh, calling you in, and Starbuck is a reference to Starbucks from Moby Dick. One of the reasons why I want to talk about Moby Dick, because references to Moby Dick are everywhere, and yet my experience tells us that very few people have in fact read Moby Dick. I have read it twice. It's a almost a 500-page book, somewhere around there. It's a pretty big book, but let's go ahead and talk about it quickly. So, Moby Dick by Herman Melville. It is titled Moby Dick or the Whale. It was written in 1851. Uh, Melville was born in 1819, died in 1891. He was 72 years old. He wrote many things in his life. Melville himself went out on a whaling ship. He, uh, lived in the Nantucket area, which is very much the East Coast. And he lived in the time of the 18, uh, the early to mid 1800s where whaling was a huge industry. Ships would go out, they would hunt whales, they would kill the whales, and they would harvest the whales for their blubber. Since electricity was not really invented and used, the whale blubber was often used in lamps because it burned really well. That fat would burn well and would be a good source of heat and light. So um, it's a book about hunting a whale and killing a whale. So 
Um, you might be familiar with Moby Dick because similar to A Christmas Carol, there have been dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of movies and TV shows made about Moby Dick. We are kind of fascinated with the story uh, throughout many, many different decades. And this is just one screenshot from IMDb, but um, there yeah, is probably good. This is probably one third of the whole offering. So, um, yeah. So people love the story of Moby Dick. So you should be familiar with it. You might have heard of some elements of Moby Dick. It's very likely because it's very popular. So one of the things that we talk about when we talk about literature are the genres. We have read different genres. We've read the stories, poems. We've read a novel. We are planning to read a play next semester. All of us listen to music. Some of us listen to country and rap. And some of us listen to oldies. And some of us listen to hard rock and heavy metal. All of these are different genres. Some of us read spiritual texts like the Bible or other similar texts like that. We read nonfiction, real stories about real people, biographies. These are all different types of writing. They require slightly different reading skills. When I read a biography, I'm going to approach the story differently than if I'm reading the Bible or listening to a piece of modern pop music. All right. One of the things that Moby Dick does is it offers a whole bunch of different writing genres within the pages of one book. It uses the first person narrative to tell us the tale, and we'll talk about the narrator in a minute. It's an adventure tale, right? We're going whaling. Uh, it's exciting. It's a travelogue as the ship literally goes all over the oceans, all over the world. It uses hymns within the book and sermons within the book. It uses scientific writing. There's literally chapters that are just like scientific breakdowns on the whale and the whale anatomy, all kinds of different stuff. It uses dramatic script form as in character one spoke, and character two replied, and character three said. Um, many chapters in Moby Dick offer an entirely new genre in which to read the story, a new way to read the story. So that was one of the very unique things about Moby Dick, is that every chapter, many chapters, offer you an entirely new way in which to read the story. All right, uh, so Moby Dick, the great white whale. Whalers would hunt whales, kill the whales, and melt their blubber or fat for oil. Uh, Captain Ahab and his crew are whalers, but at one point a white whale fought back and Ahab lost his leg. So the whale crashed into the ship. Uh, you know, there was mayhem and madness. Ahab lost his leg in the battle. And so now Captain Ahab uses his crew to hunt the whale over the entire ocean to get revenge. The first line of this book tells us the narrator. The first line says, call me Ishmael, which I love. It's so simple. It's such a great beginning. Call me Ishmael. That's it. Sense one. We now know who is speaking. We know the narrator's name. And Ishmael tells us the entire story. So it starts off with Ishmael wanting to become a whaler. So he goes down to the docks. And there he meets a guy named Queequeg, who is a man tattooed all over. He is a man of probably uh, Polynesian background. Uh, so we have Ishmael and Ishmael, uh, Ishmael meets Queequeg kind of a funny way. He, he goes down to the docks to get a job on a boat. So he spends his first night in an inn. Now, the inn is full. And so the innkeeper says, well, I got this guy up there. There's there's room up there. You could share a room with him. And Ishmael's like, all right, I'll go share a room with him. And he goes in this room, and this is who he finds. Imagine walking into a room for the first time and seeing someone like that. Ishmael was terrified, not very excited. Uh, but Queequeg uh, and Ishmael become actually very good friends, and they decide to go out on the boat together. 
And one of the things that I enjoy about that is it really shows two men from very different cultures, and they just bond, and they get along, and Queequeg ends up being a really nice guy. And Ishmael kind of learns to appreciate him for, for who he is, not just by how he looks. They go to a ship called the Pequod. This is Captain Ahab's ship, Pequod. That's about it. So, then you got Captain Ahab. All right, Captain Ahab comes out, and he's on his peg leg, so you can see it right there. He's got a peg leg, a leg made of whalebone, actually. And he tells the crew that he wants to kill the whale that took his leg. And Ahab sees the whale as the embodiment of total evil. So rather than the fact that Ahab was trying to kill the whale and the whale just fought back, Ahab was convinced that the whale is just evil and the evil must be destroyed. So what's interesting as this story goes on is that Ahab's job is to hunt whales for their fat, for their blubber. And yet he kind of forgets about his job most of the time because he's so focused on finding the whale. All he wants to do is find the whale. He's got these blinders on. So he can't see what he's supposed to do. He only sees what he wants to do. It's an important detail throughout the story. As I mentioned, it is a travelogue. And so here are the adventures of the Pequod. And they start up here, like I said, in Nantucket, the very east coast of the United States, which... At the time that Herman Melville wrote this, this was a part of the United States. So, uh, and they go all over the oceans hunting the whale. Okay. So, uh, the Pequod sails all over the globe searching for the white whale. On their journey, they do kill a few whales. Um, they encountered another ship. And Ahab asks if there's any news of Ahab. And some of the ships have seen, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Moby Dick. Some of the ships have seen Moby Dick. And one man warns that anybody who hunts Moby Dick should leave him alone because you know, Mo if you hunt Moby Dick, you will be doomed. So there's these prophetic warnings within the story. And other men agree, and they say that... Um, to, the, the, to hunt the whale is to meet disaster. So leave Moby Dick alone. There are other exciting elements of the story. Here you have one of the servant boys who lived on, uh, who lived and worked on the ship. Um, his name was Pip. Pip falls overboard and the ship sails away. And Pip, in his fear of being left in the ocean and drowning and dying, he literally goes crazy. Well, the ship turns around, comes back, they pull him out of the water, and Pip has lost his mind. And from then on, he kind of becomes a crazy person. The interesting thing is that Captain Ahab kind of becomes very fond of Pip. Captain Ahab and Pip kind of stay together. So it kind of tells us about Captain Ahab, perhaps. Um, another disgusting but interesting story. So... They would kill the whales, and they the whales are huge. So in the water, they would literally chop the whales up into pieces with them in the water. They hook them, and they do all this stuff. And um, at one time, they you know they cut the whale open, and one of the guys falls over the board into the inside of the whale. You're not going to drown in the ocean. You're literally going to drown and die inside the whale guts. And the whole thing starts to sink. And this is when Queequeg dives in the ocean, dives in the whale guts, and pulls the man out. Absolutely disgusting, but kind of a fun, interesting interlude. All right. Uh, Ahab chases Moby Dick. And he eventually catches up to Moby Dick. And Ahab and his men attack the whale. But Moby Dick attacks the Pequod instead. He rams the ship, sending the men flying. And as the whale dives, it creates a vortex in the ocean, and it pulls the ship and the men down into it. So this is kind of the climax of the story. And 
Ahab finally finds the whale and they're fighting the whale and they're going to kill the whale. But the whale fights back. And everyone dies except for Ishmael. Ishmael is the only one who's able to survive. Interestingly enough, he is able to survive by floating on an empty coffin that was made on the ship. So there's some definite symbolism there going on. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about that, but there are definitely some major symbolic issues in this story. So part of it is the limits of knowledge. One of the things the story talks about is the limits of knowledge. The whale is difficult to understand. Uh, is the whale just an animal or is the whale actually an embodiment of evil? When the whale attacks the boat, is it just doing a natural thing that animals do? Or is it actually remembering Ahab and is it hunting Ahab and is the whale attacking Ahab? Uh, so one of the things that they say is the, that the ways of Moby Dick are like the ways of God. They are unknowable to man. There are lots and lots of biblical illusions within the story, starting with Ahab himself. Ahab in the Bible was an evil king. And so then you name your main character, Captain Ahab. You definitely have that idea. Ishmael, also a biblical name. Um, so there are definitely some questions there about uh, how do we know things? Are our actions futile and fatal? Do we have control over our life and our situations? So. The deceptiveness of fate is one of them. Fate and destiny are hinted at many times. There are prophecies and foreshadowings. I mentioned Pip. One of the things that Pip does is he mentions these prophecies in his, as he's gone insane, he says these things and people go, that's a prophecy. Um, the characters interpret prophecies differently. So if I have a prophecy that, that I think and you interpret it differently, is it prophetic? If we're both interpreting the same words differently, then who's right? All right. Humans often see what we want to see. There are many social and racial issues involved in this story. Uh, we start off with Ishmael and Queequeg. And they are just starkly and radically different. And yet these two men are able to become friends. And it's really kind of a sweet thing throughout the story. Um, there are characters literally from all over the globe who are on these ships and this whaling industry. And so you kind of have a, a worldwide non-white cast of characters. Um, Ishmael says at one time, it's a great line. He says, it's better to be with a sober cannibal than a drunken Christian, which is a pretty shocking line, especially at that time where people were so hierarchical, where I'm a, I'm a, you know, a good white male Christian. I'm kind of the top of the pack. And so everybody else is beneath me. And the character written by Melville is basically saying, look, I would rather be with a clear-minded, sober, meaning not drunk, a clear-minded, sober, good cannibal, this wild uh, ethnic person from these backwaters of the world, I would rather be with that person than somebody who claims to be a Christian but is drunk and has all of the negative qualities of a drunkard. It was a pretty shocking statement to be made at that time. And it's a great statement to be made. I'd rather be with good people who are different from me than bad people who are similar to me. All right. One of the other issues is certainly the exploitation of uh, the nature of whaling. Uh, tragically and terribly, because of this time in the 1800s, many whales were hunted to the point of extinction. Um, it got so bad that laws were made and the, literally the entire world kind of changed the way they did things. Um, hopefully, you know, as we've changed our hunting habits, whales have been able to start to repopulate the, the, the oceans, but many whales were hunted to extinction. And it was 
pretty tragic and terrible. And you can find some old pictures and images and drawings, and it's pretty horrific. The ocean's literally red with blood as just, just the, the horror of the killing of these animals. And Melville kind of points us out and he goes, we got some problems here with the way we are hunting these whales. So lots and lots of things going on. I mean, you would expect there to be lots of things going on, certainly in a 500 page novel. But what Moby Dick is probably most famous for is this idea of hunting for your white whale. Sometimes that's considered hunting for your dream and your goal. And sometimes that dream or goal can be poisoned to you. What happens to Ahab? Ahab becomes singularly, almost psychotically, manically focused on finding his whale. His job is to hunt whales in general and bring back their blubber. But he risked everyone's life. He put his ship in danger. He put his own life in danger to achieve the single-minded goal. So when you become so focused, be careful, because as you hunt that white whale, you might end up causing great harm to others around you and to yourself. So there's lots of great symbolism here in the white whale and in Ahab, so singular, singularly focused on his goal. And that's how most people reference Ahab today. When they talk about Ahab, they talk about that single-mindedness. We talk about that white white whale. We talk about that elusive dream, that elusive goal, perhaps that dangerous desire that we have. So, all right. And then you'll also see lots and lots of comics with uh, Moby Dick. So let's go through these so that you can kind of have that context. So it's kind of funny because this is a picture of like a bar scene. And you got the whale here drinking his, his uh, martini, right? Bob begins to regret his decision to stay for one last drink. Great. Yes, great. Ahab is hunting the whale, and now this guy's caught in the middle. <laughs> Here's Captain Ahab with his peg leg. Going to kill the whale. And dang it, why did I stay? I should have gone home. Now there's going to be a problem. All right. Moby Trump. So here we have Moby Dick turned into Donald Trump. This one, of course, is pretty relevant. And you have all of these other things attached to it. And Captain Ahab, as a part of the media, CNN and MSNBC, BuzzFeed, all of these news organizations who have tried to kill the whale, they get caught up in it and it ends up destroying them. So certainly a political comment saying that as you hunted Donald Trump with all of your, you know, scandals, what it ended up doing is killing the media. Now, whether or not you believe that is, you know, up to your interpretation, but that's the joke. That's what's being presented here. All right. Yeah, I love this one. Here's Captain Ahab. Flowers? For me? I still hate you. It's from the white whale. Uh, it's funny. All right, over here. The great white whale on vacation. Oh, not much. Just relaxing a bit. Trying to get some color. He's not white anymore. He's getting his little tan. <laughs> He's got the wound on his back because, you know, he got harpooned. He's reading Moby Dick. Get it? It's funny. All right. I like this one. Here's Moby Dick with his cell phone on Snapstagram. Ahab would like to know your current location. Don't allow, allow. Get it? Because our phones are always asking for our location. And Ahab hunts Moby Dick across the whole world. Get it? Ahab wants to know your look. Guys, if I have to explain this stuff to you, come on. All right. I think this is the last one. Literary limericks, which are very funny. A grizzled old captain lost one of his shins. And he wants the culprit to pay for his sins. Obsessed, he set sail to defeat the white whale. But everyone drowns and the giant beast wins. So there you go. The entire story summed up in a limerick. And if you don't know what a limerick is, that is a lesson for a whole nother day. But if you love literature and poetry, you definitely appreciate that. Now, oh, I do have one more. Conflict Resolution Center. Kind of like a psychiatrist or... <laughs> 
clear my calendar for the rest of the week, Carol. This is going to take a long time. We got Ahab and Moby Dick here to talk about their problems. Now, that being said, I have read Moby Dick twice. I have read it once on my own. I have read it once for a master's uh, course in literature. And I didn't like it. That's not true. I like the story in general. It's a very interesting, broad, big story. I like the story of Ahab. I like the story of hunting the whale. I like Ishmael and Queequeg and all the other characters. What I don't like are all those genre interludes that I spoke of earlier. I found it to be distracting and odd. I did not appreciate the the way in which the story was told. Um, that's why I think some of the movie versions are actually more entertaining because they're a little bit more straightforward stories. But that being said, I have read it. Um, it's an important story to read. One should be familiar with it. Here is a much lesser known story by Herman Melville called Typey. And I really enjoyed this one because this is about the story of somebody going to a Polynesian island and kind of living with the cannibals and meeting the people there and just talking about life there in general. So uh, kind of imagine, you know, before there was, you know, modern tourist industry that might take you to these beautiful places. Imagine kind of essentially living on what we might consider a desert island with uh, the natives. So anyway, I enjoyed Taipei also by Hel Herman Melville. If I had to recommend a story to read, I would recommend Taipei. If I had to recommend a story for you to be familiar with, I would say be familiar with Moby Dick. It is Herman Melville's most popular story. Unfortunately, Melville never saw much critical success in his life. Some of his books were liked. Some of his books were, yeah, Moby Dick was not one of the ones that was particularly popular at the time. But anyway, so he kind of died uh, not being very popular. Anyway, that's the end of that. So happy reading. Talk to you later. Bye-bye now.